I squirm whenever I squirm whenever I squirm. time we watched season 10 episode 12 squirm with the short a case of spring fever squirm where i guess worms go eat us hey you're not adam no no i'm the other one that left for a while to procreate now i'm back but just for a bit yeah adam is a little bit swamped with work and school and other stuff so beth is doing a little pinch hitting coming out of retirement testing her metal against the big squirm <laughs> Yeah, what what a one to choose. I really feel like this would have been a perfect Adam episode, so I'll I'll, I'll do my best to be really interested in goo and spirit gum. <laughs> well, before we get to that, we have a little bit of follow-up from our Master Ninja episodes, which, you know, you weren't around for, but I did listen, I promise. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're keeping up with the homework. <laughs> but uh yeah, so, 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 so some news. Some things that we forgot to mention or didn't know about. Ned from another megaphonic podcast, By the Bywater, your Tolkien podcast of choice, wrote in to say that David McCallum, who was in Master Ninja 2, when we were listing some of the things he did, we left off something important, <gasps> something which I should have known about, but I never realized that David McCallum plays Ducky on NCIS. He doesn't look anything like David McCallum anymore. Is, is there a big age difference now? It, I mean, he's much older now. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's, he's in his eighties now, I believe. And I think he has, he may have just retired from the show or he's about to, I, I'm not sure. I haven't visited my stepfather in a while, so I haven't seen NCIS <laughs> lately, but because of my stepfather, I've seen quite a lot of NCIS and, uh, he's one of the few things I can stand about it. So I'm, I'm, I feel bad that I didn't recognize him. Oh, well, I mean, he, he might not have what a lot of really popular actors have where they just are old and they stay that way for 50 years. <laughs> I'm starting to watch the new Picard show and like, yeah, he looks slightly older, but he also just looks like Picard who just had like a bad sleep, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's always looked a bit old, whereas McCallum had a baby face mm-hmm. and he still looks way younger than he is, but still. In other news, Amy, our regular YouTube commenter. Yes, thank you, Amy, for filling up that otherwise very empty space. She's one of the main reasons why we keep putting these on YouTube. Um, (laughs) But she points out that Bill Conti, who did the Master Ninja theme song, or the theme song, rather, to the Master, which isn't used in the Master Ninja, quote-unquote, movie versions. Anyway, that guy who wrote the very excellent Master theme, he also wrote the Rocky theme song, you know, Gonna Fly Now. Okay. (laughs) You know that one? <laughs> Not I of the Tiger. Gonna fly now, flying high now. Oh, it's mostly one. instrumental, yeah. Anyway, one of the other writers of that song was Carol Connors, who you might remember because we covered the movie that she was in, Catalina Caper. Oh, yeah. She's the one who sings The Book of Love. She seemed nice. She seemed nice, and, and, and the Rocky theme song is a much better song than The Book of Love. But, yeah. And I'm told that you have a bit of follow-up for us. Yeah, so I was listening to the last episode, and both you and Adam were trying to come up with a story about a hamster, and you couldn't come up with anything. Nope. So I thought I would contribute my hamster story, which is not my hamster story, it's my husband's. Oh no, oh no, this is not, that's not a good sign. (laughs) Your husband's stories end terribly. (laughs) This one d- doesn't, for once. So, before I met him, he lived in the wintry city of Winnipeg. He was going to university there. So, because it's Winnipeg and there's not a lot to do, they would go to the pet store often. This was back when pet stores actually had a lot of pets, like actual puppies and kittens and things like that. So, he was watching a bunch of hamsters in this one cage. They were all sleeping in a big pile. It was very cute in like a little like nest. And one of them would come up out of the nest and go and grab a little nibble, a little bark stick, like just a little seed off of the stick, and then go into the other habit trail and just kind of sleep in there. And then another one came out and did the same thing. Another one came out, another one came out. Until finally, there's only one left. He comes out, and instead of taking a little nibble, he takes a whole stick, goes on his back, and launches it right into his mouth, and just goes, puts it down, moves on to the next habit trail, can't get in. 
And he's scurrying and putting shavings all over the place, and he can't get in. He gets really angry, so he poops, takes the poop, and throws it at the hamster pile. No! He tells his roommate, who's with him, he's like, go get the pet shop owner. I'm taking this one home with me. <laughs> Did the hamster ever bite him? Uh, no, he had giant balls. That's not the same Apparently thing at they all. Get, they get sick and then they get really huge balls. They look really painful. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, how about worms? Worms. Worms. Worms what eat people. This time we watch season 10, episode 12, Squirm. But first, a short. Be careful what you wish for, especially if what you wish for is a world without springs. Our man Gilbert is fixing his couch. As you do. And that means dealing with all those confounded springs inside the couch. Ugh, am I right? While in frustration, Gilbert cries out, I hope I never see another spring as long as I live. And then, a cartoon imp named Coily appears and fulfills his every fantasy. Or, well, okay, just that that one fantasy about the springs. A world without springs. Ah! But oh no, it turns out that every last thing in the world operates with springs. Or with spring action. Or, you know, it's kind of springy. Anyway, Gilbert learns his lesson, converts to springlicanism, and bores all his friends on the golf course with the good news about springs. The end. Well, and now for our feature presentation. After extended footage of a storm, the film opens on a knockoff Tennessee Williams play with a Blanche Dubois-esque Southern Belle lugubriously monologuing about the flooding and loss of electricity to her young daughters. Oh, and there's Roger, too, the local Lenny, who does odd jobs for the family in the hopes of catching the eye of older daughter Geraldine, or Jerry. Ah, but Jerry's heart has already been claimed by another, a fellow named Mick from New York City, who's scheduled to arrive that very day to visit and do some antiquing. Jerry convinces poor lovelorn Roger to let her borrow his truck to pick him up. He just can't say no to her, but does ask her to please be careful about the cargo, a hundred thousand bloodworms and sandworms harvested for his father's bait business. Cut to Mick, who immediately gets on the wrong side of the locals, and especially Sheriff Reston, with his demands for egg creams at the local cafe. When Mick finds a worm in his drink, both sides accuse the other of pulling a prank. Then they apparently lose all the worms, which results in Roger getting humiliated in front of Jerry and Mick by his father. Though Mick tries to patch things up by suggesting that the three of them go fishing later. Things get worse when Jerry and Mick uncover a skeleton at the local antique dealer's property. Suspecting another prank, Reston threatens to arrest Mick if he sees him again. Later, during their fishing trip, Mick is bitten by his bait, which Jerry finds surprising since worm jaws shouldn't be strong enough to break human skin. Ah, Roger explains, unless those worm jaws have been electrified, and he has a childhood scar to prove it. Mick decides to investigate the matter further, leaving Jerry alone in the boat with Roger. Roger starts harassing Jerry, and when she pushes him down, the bait attacks him, crawling into his face. He takes off into the woods, where he eventually runs into Mick and attacks him with his own board. Why was he carrying a board? Anyway, there's some stuff about Mick figuring out through dental records or something that the worms are what have been skeletoning people, but it absolutely doesn't matter because Wormageddon soon descends on the town, eating nearly everyone alive. Though he broke his ankle in his tussle with Roger, Mick still manages to rescue Jerry and the two weather the worm apocalypse by climbing onto a tree. They wake up in the morning to a repairman doing his best Boomhauer impression, while apparently explaining to them that the power has been restored. The movie ends on a somewhat happy note when it's discovered that Jerry's ungainly but resourceful sister Alma survived by locking herself in a worm impervious hope chest. Awkward oversized teenage girls for the win! Meanwhile, on the satellite of love, it's time for the annual safety preparedness check. The bots have been using all the safety equipment to prank Mike, and so they're doomed. Down in Castle Forester, it's time to hold a fair. Pearl has made pickles out of cucumbers and Windex. The bots show off the pig they've raised, which now weighs 5,743 pounds, or 2,600 kilograms for our civilized listeners. Turns out Mike didn't even know the satellite had a feedlot. In segment two, Mike wonders if there's a Coily-esque sprite who would advocate for him. Crow declares that he hopes he never sees Mike again as long as he lives. And sure enough, a sprite named Mikey appears and makes Mike disappear. Then Mikey waits for the bots to rue their decision. 
but instead of sticking with the bit and having a segment without Mike in the theater, they give in to Mikey's demands to beg for Mike's return. At the halfway point, Tom has gone all Southern Bell. As an antidote, Mike and Crow expose him to very Yankee items like Pepperidge Farms, George Steinbrenner, and Pastrami. It mostly works. And in segment four, Mike is electrifying a worm, a worm named Emmett. He's trying to make giant mutant killer worms. It doesn't work, but it turns out that crispy fried worms are a tasty treat. And after the movie, Crow is dressed up like the sister in the movie, which I guess means he's very tall. And he tips over. And because he's extremely tall, he falls over very, very slowly, which isn't how physics works at all, but okay. Pearl has added bungee jumping to the fair, but the bungee cord is too long, and when she pushes Brain Guy over, he just splats, I guess. Anyway, the end. Well, Chris, I don't get the sense you're too impressed by the shorts. Um, no. No, I was not that <laughs> impressed by the shorts. But, you know, this is your big return for a, for a nice late season 10 episode. The one that's supposed to be the next to last ever mm. of the original run of the show. What did you think of this episode? I liked it. Yeah? Yeah, I was actually really pleasantly surprised. They weren't being mean in a way that sometimes turns me off of sci-fi episodes. They were just kind of casually watching and just undercutting any tension with really laid back, but ultimately forgettable goofs. And that makes for pleasant watching. I really enjoyed it. It took a movie that I otherwise would not enjoy watching and it made it fun to watch. So thank you for that. And yeah, I, th- I felt like this was a very pleasant watch. I, I I didn't even mind the sketches so much. Like I, I just felt like sometimes they just took an idea and, and just held on to it a little bit too long. Like I think the worm one would have been really funny if they just would have stopped once Mike took that bite out of the worm. They just stopped there. Yeah. It would have been so much funnier, you know? That would have been better. Yeah. Otherwise it, it just seemed to move quickly. It didn't seem very plotting. And I was like, yeah, this is this is this is what I want from my MST three K. Good job, guys. Huh. So what did you think of the short and the film? Both were super fun. That might have something to do with it. Yeah. The film is, you know, the kind of goofy horror that I think is is perfect for this kind of treatment, right? Like it's ultimately G-rated. It doesn't really matter what's going on. It's got a goofy idea, a lot of colorful characters and a weird setting. The southernness of it was buttered on in a way that I kind of enjoyed. You know, it's a great midnight movie, and the short is legendary. I mean, now I know where that Simpsons, like, zinc yep. short comes from. It's It has to be this. It has to be the spring. It is. It's absolutely from that, yeah. Yeah, this is the thing that I found with this episode, was that I think the short is terrific, and I think the movie is as you as you were suggesting, it's not a movie that I would seek out and watch on my own, and I'm kind of glad to have watched it. It's a weird movie. Yes. <laughs> and it was, you know, and the only reason I, I watched it was because it was on this show. And in, in many ways, having Mike and the Bots there did make it easier for me to watch. It would have been a lot trickier for me to get through without them. But at the same time, I think the short is funnier without them. <laughs> I don't think they add anything particularly good to the short. That's a really good point. I mean, the short is so incredibly bizarre on its own. You can kind of tell the people who put it together knew that this was a ridiculous concept that someone would be so so bereft if springs were no longer in their lives the only way to turn it around and make it entertaining was to suggest like then they become a convert and a zealot and alienate their friends through their discussions of uh, of springdom it's a completely silly concept and they know it and i'm not sure that the jokes from from mike and the bots do much to improve it and i don't remember any of them no i don't either i mean it's not like i didn't like them being there it was a nice accompaniment but i mean we're so used to these older like educational films being so educational in quotations being so really earnest right that it's it's funny to come across one that seems to know that the whole concept it's going behind is is unsupportable like i get the sense that some industry guy is like, can you make a thing about springs? And some producer's just like, I'll do my best. Well, it's the, the <laughs> industry was Chevrolet, and the producer was Jam Handy, mm. who who made several of the shirts that MST3K did. But yeah, I think I think sometimes uh, we just have a difficulty reading or or appreciating the humor that was intended. 
you know, sometimes it just comes off flat or sometimes we're just like, they seem really serious and, and they're not as they're not so serious. Similarly with the movie, like I found that again, as you said, like, I don't remember much in terms of the jokes that they made. I do remember that they kept insisting that the movie was worse than I thought it was. I didn't find that. I, I got the sense that they found a very breezy movie to comment on, too. They weren't insulted by the movie's in- existence, which is something I sometimes get from the sci-fi era. That's certainly true. But I guess what I'm saying is that they kept making fun of things in the movie that weren't happening anymore. Like, the two characters, you know, they're looking for the, the old antique stealer, and, and they yell out Beardsley a few times when they're looking for him, and then they find the skeleton. The, and then Mike and the bots keep making jokes about them yelling, Beardsley! Beardsley! For ages, <laughs> even after they figured out that Beardsley's dead, and like, the whole movie has moved on. But this one little flaw, I guess, early on in the movie, they're just going to keep harping on it. It's, it's not funny that they keep bringing it up. It's not relevant to, like, things that the movie is doing poorly right now. It's just, oh, they found something, and they're just going to keep hitting that one note again and again. That's what I was talking about with the sketches, too. It just seems like when they, they they know they find something good, they have an instinct now to kind of run it into the ground a little bit. It, it wasn't bad enough that it made it a sour experience. I think they only gave into that a few times. No, this isn't like some of the other sci-fi episodes where I've walked away frustrated because they were making really offensive jokes or they were just yelling at the movie that it's stupid, stupid, stupid. Like, it wasn't nearly that bad. In no way did they worsen the experience of watching the movie. I just found that they were kind of irrelevant for both. The The movie is goofy enough. If you're the sort of person who enjoys that kind of movie, you can just watch it on your own and it's going to be funny. I think the meanest they get is maybe to Alma, the sister. But even then, like, as somebody who was an extremely, and still is, an extremely tall, lanky, ungainly <laughs> teenage body, like, that is... I'm a total big Ethel and I get it. So Yeah. Yeah, they just overstate how bad things are, I found. And and it just rang false to me. I don't know. But it wasn't that bad. I'm 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 harping on it too much, I guess. It's a perfectly fine episode, but definitely everybody should watch a case of spring fever. Indeed. Missed it or not. So this is a movie about worms. <laughs> Do you find worms scary? Not scary gross because they're supposed to be scary here i can see where they're going from you just take something that's kind of unsettling and then you just electrify it volumize it you know you either make the thing bigger or you make them a lot yeah i think in the case of worms making the thing bigger is much scarier because then you have tremors or dune you know it just works (laughs) a little better if you just upscale the worm instead of making many worms Although the dune worms aren't that scary. But yeah, there's a scene in the movie where the living room becomes filled with worms. <laughs> and do you know how they did that effect? It looks like spaghetti. Yeah, uh, it looks like <laughs> spaghetti, but it's worms. They built a platform and then they covered it several inches deep in worms of thousands and thousands and thousands of worms. Good Lord. Those are all real worms worming around right then. Oh, boy. Yeah. These worms are special worms that they picked up in Maine. Oh. The state of Maine. And they'd taken so many of these worms from Maine that it just ruined the fishing industry because they couldn't find any worms to use. Because of this one film? Yeah, oh, because wow. they had taken like 100,000 worms out of Maine or some ridiculous number and transported oh. them all to Georgia. <laughs> I'm surprised there weren't bigger ecological catastrophes caused by that. Guys, guys, you could have just used spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did use some fake worms in some of the shots, but in that particular shot, it is several inches of worms in an entire <laughs> it's, living room. It's worms all the way down. <laughs> this movie is ridiculous with its special effects, by the way. You remember the scene where the worms eat the roots of a tree and cause it to fall over and crash right onto where they're eating dinner on the on this little extension on the first floor of the house? Right. The, and do you know how they did that? Uh, visual effect did they actually crash a tree into the they actually crashed a tree into the living room while the actors were in the room <laughs> they had one take oh, to do it not even stunt people oh my god yeah you can see the actors running away from it apparently the tree came very close to hurting one of them ah this is low budget filmmaking at its finest yeah holy crap um well, I'm glad nobody was hurt for this <laughs> completely straight to video release. 
Or was it? It it was not a straight-to-video release. It has a reasonably strong reputation, or certainly did, amongst people who are into these kinds of movies. And it was 1976. There was no straight-to-video at that point. But yeah, I mean, Leonard Maltin gave it three stars. That's a half a star more than Laser Blast. (laughs) Exactly. And it is half a star better than Laser Blast, I'd argue. (laughs) Yeah, it is a a fun movie. I I don't want to suggest that it doesn't deserve to uh, be enjoyed in a certain context. Yeah. Um, But there were different ways of doing these stunts that wouldn't be quite so... (laughs) expensive or dangerous no exactly so i've decided i would try to learn a thing or two about worms and in particular carnivorous worms Mm. because i wanted to know you know can this happen here the film is based on a true story sort of tell me more well uh one day when the writer and director jeff lieberman was a kid he and his brother decided to hook up a, a transformer into wet soil and they used electricity to drive worms out of the ground all right And then he saw that the worms didn't like the flashlight that they were using to see the worms because they're light sensitive. And then this led to the basic plot of the film. Mm. Those worms did not nibble on their feet and reduce them to skeletons, obviously. Basically, worms can't do that. (laughs) Even, (laughs) Even the carnivorous worms, which totally do exist, don't quite attack in the way that the worms in this film, which is fine. Like, they don't have to. It's a movie. But Most of the really nasty worms live underwater anyways. The uh, most interesting carnivorous worm that I came across was an aquatic Atlantic Ocean worm. It lives in sort of warm and shallow waters. And it's called the bobbit worm. (laughs) And you can guess why? We'll just let our listeners figure out why it's called that. (laughs) Well, it is named after that, yes. They can grow to be anywhere from uh, like 10 centimeters to 300 centimeters. Which is like 10 feet. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, that's just it. Like, you asked me if I find worms scary. And, like, regular old earthworms? No. But tapeworms? If we're talking parasitic ones? Yeah. I'd rather not have one inside me. Yeah, tapeworms, hookworms, you don't want those. Leeches are worms. Are they? Yeah. One of the other interesting things that I found in my research was another set of carnivorous worms that are bioluminescent. They're in New Zealand in a cave called Waitomo or something like that. And I've popped a link into the Slack if you want. You can see the picture of them. It seems very pretty. Oh, I think I've seen these on planet Earth. I bet. I totally bet they've been on planet Earth. They deserve it. Yeah. Creepy carnivorous worms that look like caves that look like the night sky. Yeah. But they'll totally eat you. Well, they'll eat something. They'll eat flies, Mm. I think. I don't know if they would eat you. And I don't think they'd leave a skeleton behind if they did. Um... Would you say that worms slither? They squirm. I think if there's Mm. one thing this movie has shown, it's that they squirm. (laughs) And eat faces. (laughs) And eat all sorts of, the entire body, except for the skeleton. Actually, they eat the skeleton too at some point, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) At a certain point, they're just like, why would we leave anything behind? That's inefficient. Yeah. It's calcium. (laughs) Yeah. That's what bones are good for. I thought worms help break up bones and bone meal. Isn't bone meal a thing? Bo- uh, yeah. yeah okay. I don't think this movie's got the strongest sense of how worms work. Yeah. But they know how to make a shot full of all of them. It's very impressive when you think about it. <laughs> Can you just imagine being like, you know, part of the crew and you're just taking buckets of worms and just dumping them into this living room? It's like, needs more worms. <laughs> <laughs> it's not work I would want to do. <laughs> Uh, I'll give it to the the actor who played Roger then, because he went right into it and then basically like gets face up in it. That's that's <laughs> some good acting, man. That is. But egg creams, those are good. Well, this is just it. Like there are some drinks where you want a worm in it, right? No, no, no. You don't. The movie may have led you astray here. You don't traditionally put a worm into your egg cream. No, that's only tequila. Yes. So, have you ever had an egg cream? No. Uh, see, this is what happens if you don't grow up in New York. <laughs> so, in the movie, our hero, our hero, I'm not sure which is supposed to be the hero. And in the movie, Mick, who is visiting from New York City down to Georgia to go antiquing, as you do on a five day antiquing trip. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he establishes his outsiderness and his New Yorkerness by going into a diner and ordering an egg cream, which they are like, I don't know what that is. Because egg creams, I mean, they have spread into the rest of New England, I guess, but they're a New York thing. Okay. 
and they're kind of an old-timey New York thing. It's You can get an egg cream now, but it's sort of a thing that you would get at a soda fountain. It does sound like something Mr. Burns would order. Yes, absolutely, if he were a New Yorker. <laughs> but you've never had an egg cream. No. Like, I mean, I have to imagine they're like eggnog. No. No, they're not. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no egg in them. <laughs> what? <laughs> Famously, there's no egg and no cream in an egg cream. Okay. What's this crazy New York garbage you're trying to sell out to me? Well. If you'll go to your front porch, you'll find a brown paper bag. Right now? Right now. <laughs> like, by front porch, do you mean our slack? I mean, go open your front door, go to the front porch, and go grab the bag that's waiting for you there. Oh, my God. This better not be a flaming bag of poop. No, it shouldn't be. What? <laughs> okay. So you'll find inside that bag. What have you got there? I have, uh, <laughs> I have milk. Good. I have chocolate syrup. Uh huh. <laughs> I have club soda. Okay. Or soda club. <laughs> so those are your ingredients for uh, an egg cream. I'm going to encourage you to make one right now and try it. You don't have to finish it, but you should, you should try it. <laughs> All right, let me go get a get a tall get a glass. nice glass and a tall spoon. All right. All right. What do I put in first? First, you're going to put in a few inches of whole milk. It's got to be whole milk. It has to be whole milk. How indulgent! It, it has to be whole milk because lower percentage milks don't create the foam that you need. Okay. All right. So you've got about, you know, two or three fingers of milk in there. All right. Then you will want to slowly pour the club soda, the seltzer, into the glass. Slowly because it will fizz and, and create foam. You might want to tilt the glass a bit. Okay. Bartender style. Yeah. Like the whole can? Uh, fill it most of the way up. Okay. You leave yourself, you know, an inch or so at the top. There we go. Wow, this is looking great already. Okay. <laughs> Then you'll want to squirt a little bit of syrup into it. Maybe, eh, you know, two big squirts. I don't know. You have the wrong kind of chocolate syrup. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get Fox's You Bet outside of New York because it's a New York <laughs> brand. Uh, and I could have ordered it online, but it would have taken weeks to get here. Right now, I feel like I'm in the clockwork hour, which I have a very tall glass of, of white right here. This won't be as ultraviolent as that. Okay. And then you will want to carefully stir it so that you create some foam but you don't overflow everywhere. Okay. So it'll end up ideally looking like chocolate milk with a nice white foam at the top. That is precisely what I have. Excellent. You have an egg cream. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm trying to describe it now. It looks like thick root beer. Hmm. All right. Well, bombs up. Enjoy. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you. Well, you know what? Upon second drinking, at first I was just like, what is this? Right. Because um, you don't expect your milk to be fizzy. <laughs> no, no. You know what? Surprisingly refreshing for a milk drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a it's a summer drink. Huh, interesting. Like, this shouldn't exist, but it's interesting that it does. Well, it's interesting. It, it, it came about, we're not quite sure when, but sometime between like 1890 to 1920, thereabouts. Oh, yeah. Totally. Came out of Brooklyn, invented by Jewish immigrants. Like chocolate sodas were popular, and then they wanted to put ice cream in it because that kind of makes sense. It's like a root beer float or you know chocolate syrup float. But then it's like, oh, we could just add milk and it'll do the same thing. Is one of the theories. There, there are a few other theories, including the idea that you know, like, where does the name come from? The mm -hmm. idea that it's a, an imitation of a drink that somebody had while they were visiting Paris called a chocolat. A creme, you know, ah. so it's an egg creme, an egg cream, chocolate egg cream. So, you know, maybe chocolate and cream could be done. Some people do make it with cream instead of milk. It kind of reminds me of recipes, like recipe cards that often people put out from like the 50s and 60s, where they had a, a much more limited number of vegetables and fruits available. So everything had pimentos and radishes in it. Oh, yes. You know, you just kind of had to work with what you had. Yeah. So it's just like, well, we have a lot of milk. Because <laughs> we're all Anglo-Saxons and we drink milk all the time. So we got to do something with all this milk. Exactly. So I should say that there are also vanilla egg creams that would be with vanilla syrup instead of chocolate syrup. 
And also, so I, you know, I grew up in New York, but it was already much too late for egg creams to be a common thing. You had to hunt out a place that would serve you an egg cream. Okay. So I have had an egg cream at an egg, at a at a spot that was old and traditional, but that was a long time ago. And I had a friend who would make egg creams with sort of a, a, a cheap shortcut, which is he would take cream soda mm-hmm. and add milk. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I mean, I'm enjoying this, but I have the kind of genetics that's okay with dairy, but the combination of a very basic thing like milk with fizziness, I can't imagine it's good for everybody's tummies. You know, you can get carbonated milk in some parts of the world, and Coke has put together a milk and carbonated water product called Vio or Vio. They uh, they tested it in America in 2009, but uh, it was kind of a no-go. That's crazy. So then they launched it in India in 2016, and it's, I guess, more popular there. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I feel like dairy's on a downturn in North America, and I, I don't know. I grew up in rural Ontario where I was surrounded by dairy farms, so I don't think it's ever quite going to leave me. But I don't... I like this. I gotta say, now that I've been drinking it, I like it. So thank you for introducing it to me. But I can see why maybe it had its time and place. Yeah. I'm fine with it if I never have another one, but I mm. I still have a lot of hometown pride when it comes up in conversation. Hey everybody, it's time for the Shallow Thirteen. It's time for the Shallow Thirteen. Thirteen wriggling little factoids about today's experiment, Squirb. Go, Chris, go! MST3K were making jokes about today's short, a uh, case of spring fever, years before they finally riffed it, at least as far back as season three's The Saga of the Viking Women and their voyage through the waters of the Great Sea Serpent. That's the episode where Crow is obsessed with waffles, and Crow and Tom imagine a world without waffles. No waffles! Oh, what a nightmare that would be. We covered this the last time we took on a jam handy short in our episode on the violent years. But it's worth remembering, Jam Handy is short for Henry Jameson Handy. Wait, is it Jam Handy? We'll get letters if we don't mention this. Yes, Riff Tracks later took another swing at this short. But, as far as I can tell, they have not yet revisited Squirm. Squirm opens with a text crawl, a device that Star Wars would infamously rip off a few years later. Anyway, we're told that late in the evening of September 29th, 1975, a sudden electrical storm struck a rural seacoast area of Georgia. Mike quips. Uh, oh, yeah. This is the night that the lights went out in Georgia. Oh. Vicki Lawrence had a number one hit with The Night the Lights Went Out in Georgia in 1972. Yep, that's the same Vicki Lawrence from The Carol Burnett Show and Mama's Family. The Night the Lights Went Out in Georgia is one of those long story songs you used to get. It's got a guy coming home from a long trip who hears that his wife has been cheating on him. He grabs a gun and plans to kill the guy who slept with his wife, but when he arrives, the guy's already dead. And now, he's on trial for the murder, and he's given the death penalty. That's the night that the lights went out in Georgia. That's the night they hung an innocent man. Turns out, the guy's sister did the killing? And is singing us the song? Anyway, it's all very exciting, very convoluted, and very catchy. So, of course, in 1981, they made it into a movie. But when you make a movie, you sometimes end up tweaking elements of the plot, right? Pretty normal. But they ended up tweaking so many plot elements that they decided to rewrite the song. Tanya Tucker's cover of the song changes the lyrics to fit the movie. And they get rid of the line about killing an innocent man. So what's the point? Wait, let's back up a bit. The storm that incites this whole plot was on September 29th, 1975? That's that's just like a few days before I was born. Huh. Right before a commercial break, Tom says, A certain convocation of politic worms! That right there is a quote from Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 3. Claudius asks Hamlet where Polonius is, and Hamlet says he's at supper. And Polonius asks where, and Hamlet says it's not so much where he's eating, but who he's being eaten by. By a certain convocation of politic worms. Because he's dead, get it? Hamlet killed him, accidentally, thinking he was Claudius. Now worms are eating him. Mike and the Bots watched Hamlet earlier in Season 10, as we covered back in Episode 17. As they get ready for the Castle Forester Fair, Brain Guy informs us that Our grandstand act is this authentic cardboard replica of Mr. Ben Murphy himself. Ben Murphy played Kid Curry in the early 70s Western show Alias Smith & Jones, which I have never heard of. But in the early 80s, he starred in Lottery! As a guy who each week told somebody that they had won the lottery. 
this incredible concept for a show somehow lasted only one season. But I vaguely remember watching this one, so... Anyway, Ben Murphy! Scorum's writer-slash-director Jeff Lieberman was so angry about the treatment the film got with MST3K that he did something most of us only dream of doing. He sent an angry email. It's not clear whether the MST3K crew ever wrote back. Is it even a mini scorner when Adam's not around? Squirm was originally supposed to be scored by the great Bernard Herrmann. You know, the guy who scored all those Hitchcock films, Psycho, Vertigo, the guy who scored Citizen Kane? He, Bernard Herrmann, was hired to score Squirm. Sadly, he died before beginning work on the film, so the job went to Robert Prince, who is probably fine. I don't know. You'd have to ask Adam. Southerners hating on New York City was such an established trope in pop culture that it became the cornerstone of Pace Salsa commercials in the 80s and 90s. They typically go like this. A bunch of -of salt-of-the-earth cowboy types are offered an inferior salsa. When it's revealed that the pretender to Pace's picante throne is made in New York City... The cowboys wreak frontier justice, including, in one infamous example, one of the cowboys ordering the others to get a rope. Ironically, while the town this is all supposed to be taking place in, Fly Creek, Georgia, doesn't exist, there is a town called Fly Creek in New York State. And I'm sure it's very charming and not at all filled with carnivorous worms. And that's time! So Mick, our lead male character is down from New York for five days to do some antiquing. And I don't do a lot of antiquing, but you do. Yes. I once took you to, like, a a major antiquing bonanza that we have in southern Ontario. Yeah, like an outdoor antiquing fair where a bunch of different people had stalls. And Mm -hmm. it was a very nice day. We had had a lot of fun. I don't remember if we got much, but... Uh, I got a box. Oh, yeah, my husband got a box as well. They weren't antique boxes, though, or at least not the one that my husband got. It was a new box. Yeah, but in the style. This is this is the funny thing about antiquing. It. It's it's stay away from the old stuff. <laughs> it's not even that, but it, it's just like antiquing is funny because you feel like you are trying to get out of the trends and tastes of the present. But even the antique market is basically affected by current tastes, right? Like it used to be that people really liked the Victorian stuff, but now it's just like if it's not mid-century, then forget about it. Nobody wants it. So it, it's, you know, tastes in old things also come and go. I was trying to figure out why I like antiques, and the answer I came to is not very self-flattering, I have to admit. So there's this French thinker, Jean Baudrillard, who basically suggests that antiquing is a kind of nostalgia where you're trying to connect to an object that has a value that is kind of outside your current system of capitalism. So it's a kind of nostalgia for a bygone era where it connects you to a time and a place that feels a little, maybe less crass and less, you know, money focused than what you're in right now, a more authentic time. So it's essentially a kind of nostalgia, but even worse, you tend to only get antiquing in cultures that have a past that sometimes they're a little bit, like, I look around, and I have to admit, my my tastes are very English. Right. And that makes me a little worried, because there's always like kind of a little bit of... A, like, I, I'm a Victorianist, and I love Victorian era, but you can't separate Victorianism from colonialism, right? I mean, yeah, but there's a lot of things you can't separate from colonialism. Ever. <laughs> but without realizing it, I've kind of surrounded myself in kind of an island colonial style with my, my antiques. I'm like, hmm... What am I trying to evoke here? (laughs) Right. So it's problematic, but I really do feel a connection. It makes me feel, I'll say this again, like one of the things that I really love about old architecture is that you can experience a way of living in a way that isn't just intellectual, it's kind of experiential. They call it embodied space. So when I was volunteering in a 19th century house, I could actually feel how much calmer it felt to be in a place where everything's swathed in lace and everything's very quiet and carpeted and there's nothing buzzing or flashing. It's just, it's so relaxing. Well, to be fair, the 19th century place that you were working in was a very, very rich person's house. Indeed it was. It was a mansion. A long time ago, I worked at a 17th century house in New York City and the oldest standing one in New York. 
Ooh. Yeah, from 1666, I believe. And and basically, if you if you did the tour of it, each of the rooms of the house was built in a later century. So the main hearth and kitchen area and dining room area was all from the 17th century. And then there was a, a bedroom that was added in the 18th century, and then a few other rooms that were from the 19th century and something from the 20th century before it left private hands and became a museum. That is a small and cozy place, but you can sometimes feel the oppressiveness of how small and cozy it would have been because, you know, it was not, they were not, they were not poor people, but they were not fabulously well off. So. Yeah. Admittedly, like for a 19th century house, this place, like it, it had also gone through various layers, but once they didn't rely on wood fire, they had turned to radiator heat. It opened up and became a place that would not be nearly so constricting as what you would probably see from most people. So yes, it is an idealized past that we're trying to evoke with antiques too, which I think, you know, you have to examine, but I just, what I'm mostly going with antiques is a timeless style that doesn't require me to update every five years. Cause that to me seems very wasteful. And if you can find something that is evocative and has an interesting story and like is not trying to fit into a trend so that it will always just kind of have the same feeling, whether it's the present or 20 years from now, I really like that that staying power that it can have. Although nobody is forcing you to change your furniture every five years. <laughs> but, it's true, but I feel like like trends right now are designed to wear out faster, you know? I suppose, but you don't you don't have to follow them. It's a great <laughs> thing about trends. They they exist whether you follow them or not. <laughs> um so from New York City to the coast of Georgia is about a twelve hour drive. Or a bus ride. <laughs> yeah, or a bus ride. Um What's the longest you've ever gone for an antiquing trip? Well, I'm fortunate in that where my parents live, it has a lot of antiques around, and that's like a three-hour drive. That's as far as I go. I mean, I got kids. But it's <laughs> it's it's funny to think about what they're trying to set up here because uh, I actually found an article from the New York Times in the 70s where antiquing had pr- apparently become a real thing, especially in New York. Everybody was hunting for beautiful cheap furniture and they couldn't get it in new york anymore so they go out to the boonies and grab everything there and and this particular author is is lamenting that it had already been cleared out so there's this, just this sense of like these genteel rich new yorkers just plundering the you know rural areas because like these rubes don't know what these things go for and bringing them back with them right which is setting up like a, an exploitative relationship, which I think this movie is trying to kind of pin on to Mick, at least initially, that there's there's a reason why a lot of people in town do not trust him. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The antiquing is as much a part of his New Yorkeriness as the egg cream. They're both things that New Yorkers do. At least in the 70s. At least, well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I think of New York now, I don't think of antiquing and egg creams. No. You, there are still some antique stores in New York, but 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 antiquing writ broadly is not nearly as big a trend as finding furniture on the side of the road in the rich neighborhoods that they're trying to throw away and taking it back to your place. That's a thing to do. Right. That might not be as true now because of the bed bug scare, but I think it probably still is happening, and it certainly was happening when I last lived there. Oh, nice. No springs. <laughs> No springs. No springs, indeed. Uh, Coily means well. He just wants springs in the world. He wants us to appreciate the things that springs have done for this world, which we don't really have anymore, frankly. I feel like springs have all been replaced by foam and pneumatic tubes. (laughs) I mean, unfortunately, towards the end of the short, the guy gets very excited about how, when you think about it, the earth is very springy. And it's like, okay, (laughs) that's not the same. As a spring. Yeah, now he, then he just starts talking about, like, energy exchange. And that's, like, that's not exactly what we're talking about, dude. Yeah. Hitting a golf ball isn't a spring. But you're right that many of the things that are mentioned in the short don't seem to use springs anymore. I've got a list here of things that were mentioned in the short, and I thought we would quickly go over them and see whether, in fact, they still use springs. All right. Well, I mean, couches is the first one that they start with. Yeah. Some couches still have springs, but... None of mine do. It's all memory foam. No springs. Mm-hmm. Time pieces. I mean, I don't think that modern computers use springs at all. Not physical springs, certainly. No. So obviously, if you've got like a, a very fancy watch that has a tourbillon or something on it and has to be wound up, 
that will still use springs. I think even, I think even quartz, I don't know. Do quartz watches use springs? Do you know? No, I think they're mostly just clockwork, you know? It looks like from a very quick web search that no, they don't use springs. Maybe there's some tiny ones somewhere, but I think most people's timepieces are their cell phones now or their digital watches, and those don't use springs. Uh, window blinds? Do your window blinds have springs in them? No, mine are, mine are all the pull-down ones that, that have the chain. Right, and there's no like automatic mechanism for doing that. Nope, no springs there. Yeah, I imagine some window blinds are still made with springs, but plenty of them aren't. And like, you know, mostly I've got curtains. So mm-hmm. um, doors, door hinges. Yeah, what was that about? So in some door hinges, there is a spring mechanism. Uh, the, the scene where he's got the door closing behind him and it slams, that can be softened by a spring that prevents it from slamming shut. Okay. That said, plenty of hinges don't have springs in them, as far as I know. Yeah. It doesn't seem necessary to survival, like this short is suggesting. Exactly. Um, what else? Telephones. Obviously, rotary telephones used springs, and that's what's shown in the film, because it's from 1940. But we don't use rotary telephones, most of us, anymore. Mm-mm. I don't think our phones, our, our cell phones, tend to have springs in them. Wow. Yeah. Let, let's see. I have, I've got a little cigarette lighters. Well, who uses those anymore? Uh, well, smokers do. But mostly it's just like a, it's just a wheel now, right? That, that grinds against something. I don't know if there's a spring in there or not. There probably is. But again, smoking isn't as necessary as it used to be well, either. Smoking has never been. Well, smoking may have been socially necessary at one point, but it certainly wasn't necessary for life. Railroad trains apparently have springs. Yes. The, well, I mean, uh, as, as do cars, right? Because they've got mm. springs for... Um, suspension? Uh, it does look like shock absorbers often use springs oh, yeah, there springs you go. In, the, in the rear suspension. So yeah, that's still okay. there. So and, there's one thing. And they do talk about car seats. And I imagine that while some of them are memory foam, some of them probably still have springs in them. Okay. And we found one, one instance of springery, and that is in cars. Yes. But in hmm. gas pedals, is that still part of the car? Yes. Well, I imagine yes. <laughs> there's still some sort of spring that pushes it back up. Oh, okay. That would be the only sane way to do it. But I, again, I'm not an engineer. I don't know. Um, but pencil clips. <laughs> they mentioned pencil clips. That that useful device that uh, none of us can live without. For fastening onto your shirt? Or what was that? Yeah. It's a little um, metal thing that's on some pens or pencils that allows it to, to fasten to your shirt. Yeah. I don't think they actually have springs in them. I think he just might have been talking about the springy action of it. Yeah. Because it's just a it's just a tight piece of metal that's just a little bit pliant and then clamps down. But that's it's not like there's a little spring in there. I don't think. I don't think so. I wrote guns. Did they mention springs with guns? They did mention guns and springs. And I also am not a gun user or owner, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm no gunologist. I don't know whether they have springs. <laughs> I imagine they do. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something in there that has a spring. <laughs> yeah, recoil and firing pin springs. Those seem mm-hmm. to be a thing. I don't know. Mouse traps. Yeah, we still have those. Well, the classic ones that go ker-snap, like in the cartoons, those do. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of other types of mouse traps now. I don't know if all of them use springs. Well, frankly, that's. I think those are still considered the most humane because it kills them instantly. Hmm. As opposed to like glue traps or poison. But the ones that allow you to sort of trap them inside a thing and then take them outside, do those have springs? When it traps them inside a thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I guess if you're talking live traps, that would probably be the most humane. Yeah, that is definitely more humane. <laughs> as opposed to the kill traps. And the kill traps, yes. But I don't know if they have springs in them. I mean, the ones in sort of the cartoons where there's like a stick that if they walk past and get the food, then the stick is knocked over and the the box falls down. Yeah, those don't. Those don't have springs in them usually. Oh, yeah, totally have springs. Do they? Oh, yeah. But again, like, I feel like what we're realizing is springs are still in our lives, but not to the extent that they, that springy would suggest they were back in the 1940s. Pogo sticks. <laughs> which <laughs> I could never get to use. So I'm happy to, to throw them in the bin. You've never gone pogoing? I've tried. It did not go well. No, I have tried and it uh, certainly wasn't pogoing for very long. Let's put it that way. I actually never met anybody who could. I feel like there were sort of older, cool teens who yeah. would pogo by when I was young. But maybe maybe I'm misremembering something from a TV show. Yeah. The same one that who could do cartwheels is like, I don't know how you're doing that. You're obviously better than me. Oh, I think I could do a cartwheel briefly. <laughs> really? I think so. I know we were like expected to do them if we could in gym class when I was a kid. 
Is your daughter able to do cartwheels? No, no, no. no. <laughs> and then I get the feeling she won't. <laughs> but luckily, she seems to live in an era that like such feats of ability are no longer expected of children. <laughs> oh man! You know, by the time she's our age, there'll be even fewer springs out in the world. She won't even know what a spring is. Maybe they won't even know how to jump anymore. They just won't have any concept of it without springs. So, Chris, it's been lovely to be back, but I think we're pretty much out of time. Do you have anything you want to add before we throw this bait into the lake? <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I do. Um, uh, yeah, because, you know, we talked about worms and we talked about egg creams. Uh, but have you ever considered Worm in My Egg Cream? And by that, I mean the 1994 album Worm in My Egg Cream by the Pittsburgh-based underground musician Weird Paul Petrowski. <laughs> I feel like he might have borrowed that name from somebody else. Well, he came out... Well, well... (laughs) Well, actually, yeah, when he started making music in the late 80s, he switched his name for a while to Off the Wall Paul to avoid (laughs) the comparisons to Weird Al Yankovic, because they do very different Mm -hmm. things. Uh, Weird Paul does not do parodies of songs the way Weird Al does. (laughs) Weird Paul is is what you get after Weird Al is struck by God on the back of a horse. (laughs) Maybe. I don't think. He's, I don't. I don't get the sense from the little, the little bit of listening that I that I did that his music is particularly uh, religious or anything. But yes, but yeah, he um, he put out an album or a cassette called "Worm in My Egg Cream" back in the day, and it's got sixteen songs on it, and each one is titled "Worm in My Egg Cream," yeah. and they're inspired by that scene from Squirm. <laughs> he saw Squirm. Uh, he saw it well before the MSG3K episode came out, of course, and he was so mesmerized by that one scene that he decided to write an entire album of 16 songs about it. Here's the thing. I couldn't find it online. It's not on his band camp. It's not on his website. It doesn't <laughs> oh, seem no. to be available on any of the streaming services. I couldn't find any sort of illicit ways of getting it. I wasn't able to get it at all. It's lost to time? Well, I I don't think it's lost to time. It's just not available right now through the ways that we lazy people who can click, click, click and get music can get it. Oh, dear. Now, I could have been a cheater. I could have done the cheap thing. I could have emailed him (laughs) and said, hey, can I please have a copy of your album? I want to talk about it on a podcast. But that would have been cheating. That would have been no good. That's no fun. I wanted to get it the hard way. Okay. I want to get it through this podcast by mentioning it here, by seeing if perhaps Weird Paul is listening, he would write us and give us the link to it. Or perhaps somebody who listens to us is from the greater Pittsburgh area and has an interest in sort of lo-fi weird music. Uh, To be honest, like I have an interest in that sort of stuff. And I'm surprised that I hadn't heard of this guy before because he seems very much uh, the sort of thing that I would have heard about before. (laughs) It kind of does. Yeah. His music is is really sort of delightfully lo-fi and and cassette-y from that era. And it's uh, some of it is very charming that that I heard. He also is uh, the original vlogger, which is to say that he started vlogging in the 80s. Oh, He would make little videos when he was young, when he was like a teenager, including like reviewing McDonald's and things like that. And he's put them all up on YouTube now. Oh, amazing. Yeah. He's an interesting person. And, And so I would like to hear this concept album. It sounds entirely like the sort of thing I should hear, but it's not online. Come on, release the tape, release the tape, release the tape. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you have any more juicy facts about springs, or if you'd like to ask us anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com. And we're on Twitter at it is just a show. We'd love to hear from you. This show is made possible by listeners like you. For as little as $1 an episode, you can help us research and record this show. And you can listen to all our super fan bonus bits. Find out more at itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 67. Ah, it was nice to come back. Oh, it was nice to have you back. Thank you. It's nice to get away from the kids and talk about worms for a while. <laughs> so what are you going to do after you're done this episode? You're just going to sit back and relax and think about mulching some stuff? Yep. I'm going to mulch as much as I can, but then I'm going to have to get in touch with Adam because we have 
yet more podcasts to do, and he should be back for our next episode, which is going to be Season 4, Episode 1, Space Travelers, which is to say, Marooned. Ah, the one that won an Oscar. Yeah, our one Academy Award-winning MST3K film so far. I remember it being beautiful but boring. I remember loving the very first section of the movie, which goes on until the first commercial break, and there's no dialogue at all yet. And there are all these great jokes about, oh, you know, you really care about the characters. <laughs> yeah, I, I look forward to returning to it and seeing what you and Adam make of it. Well, it's been great having you back, but until next time... I've always depended on the kindness of squirmers. Don't forget to drink up your egg cream. Take it away, theme squad. Launches it right into his mouth and just goes. Wow, 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 wow.